um, thank you very much all for coming. Um, it's always, every time I come to Chile, I always think what a wonderful country it is. And uh, this time I had the opportunity to visit the Atacama Desert for two days before I came here. And it was the most, one of the most spectacular landscapes, unique landscapes you could see anywhere in the world. So I'm grateful for that opportunity. Uh, but even more than that, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with so many uh, leaders and thinkers uh, in this fantastic country. So I want to start by thanking Rector Sanchez from the Catholic University, uh, and especially Ignacio from the Centro de Politicas Publicas uh, for the invitation to be with you. It's uh, a huge pleasure and an honor for me to be with you. And I look forward to the conversation and meeting some of you during the rest of the day. I think the work that the, the Central uh, uh, Politicas Publicas is doing that we've just heard about from Ignacio is, is very, very important. This sense of creating a dialogue between the thinking and the analysis and the research and the teaching goes on inside the university and the public generally. And too often and around the world I see universities that are separated from the generality of data. -to -day. Too many people in my country for sure, but, but generally around the world, don't know what the universities do. They don't know how universities could play a key part in solving the problems of society, of the economy, of technology, uh, of culture. Uh, of the environment, whatever it might be. So I think this idea that you create a dialogue uh, actively between the academic thinking inside the university uh, and the public more generally uh, is a really powerful idea. Um, lots of academic uh, people, for all kinds of good reasons, write academic articles that are read by other academics. But too often that dialogue doesn't become public. And I, uh, salute the work that Ignacio and his colleagues are doing. It was a pleasure for me to meet them yesterday. And they've been doing this for 17 years now. And I think it's an example uh, that should uh, ring around the world. So thank you for that. Uh, before I move on, I just want to say one other thing. It's wonderful to be in this beautiful room. I love libraries. Uh, this was the library of the original university out here. It's a beautiful room. Uh, I, in, the, in the role I have as Chair, chairman of the agency that oversees the universities in England. I visit universities a lot, uh, and quite often I visit universities with new libraries. And the new libraries are wonderful, but you never see a book. <laughs> the books are on shelves down in the basement, uh, and all you see are computers. So it's lovely to be in a library with books. Thank you very much for that opportunity too. Um, it's a Catholic university, that's a, a big part of its heritage. And so I'm going to assume for the first part of what I'm going to talk about that many of you are familiar with the stories in the Bible. But if you're not familiar with the story of the Bible, which I doubt actually, I'm pretty sure you know this story, uh, it's also in the Quran. And if you're not familiar with the Quran, it's also a rock opera currently playing in London. And this is the story of the, the, the person in English we call Joseph. I think you call him Jose. And in the Quran he's called Yusuf. But it's the same person. And um, I want to take you back thousands of years to ancient Egypt. And you remember the story. I'm sure you remember it very well. The, the Pharaoh wakes up in the morning and he's had a dream. And he wakes up, and if you're a pharaoh, you have courtiers around you all the time, day and night. So he wakes up and he points to the courtiers and he says, I've had this dream. There were seven fat cows that went in front of me, and then there were seven thin cows followed them. I want you to tell me what this dream means. And the courtiers are afraid of the pharaoh. He's a very scary person, very powerful, godlike person. They're afraid of being wrong. They don't want to give him bad advice. So they all tremble and they look at their shoes. And he says again, I've had this dream, what does it mean? Eventually, after a long silence, one of the courtiers says, Well, Pharaoh, we're not very good at dreams. But we have this guy in prison who's brilliant. He's really good at dreams. And the Pharaoh said, bring him here. 
So they send the soldiers to get Joseph, Jose, out of prison and they bring him and they sling him on the floor across the marble. You can hear the chains rattle as he slides across the marble and he ends up in front of the pharaoh. And the pharaoh says, I've had this dream. What does it mean? And Joseph says, Pharaoh, I know exactly what that dream means. It means you're going to have seven years of plenty. The corn will grow, the sun will shine, the Nile will be full, the irrigation system will be fantastic. You'll have more corn than you know what to do with. But then, you're going to have seven years of famine. The sun will be too hot, the Nile will be nearly empty, the corn will grow and shrivel. Egypt will be hungry. Now, Joseph could have stopped there. He's done a brilliant job of interpreting the dream. Pharaoh's pleased to have the dream interpreted. But Joseph doesn't stop there. He waits a little while. Pharaoh says nothing. And Joseph says, So, Pharaoh, this is what you've got to do. You've got to save the corn during the seven years. You've got to save 20% of the corn every year for seven years and store it. And then, when the famine comes, you have enough corn to feed the people of Egypt through the seven years that follow. Um, and Pharaoh is very impressed by this. And he says, Joseph, these aren't the exact words of the Bible. He says, Joseph, that is brilliant. And then he says, I know you're only 30 years old, but in spite of that, I'm going to put you in charge of gathering the corn for the next seven years. You're in charge. I've got all these courtiers around me, but they don't do anything. You know what you're talking about, so you're going to be in charge of this. And by the way, I don't want you hanging around in my palace like the rest of these people. I want you to get out there and organize it properly so you can have my second best chariot. I'm keeping the best one because I'm fair. And you can have my second best one. And I want you to put somebody in charge of each region, somebody in charge of each district, somebody in charge of each barn. I want you to build barns and start saving the corn. And uh, I thank you very much for what you've done. Go and do it. And you know the story. The corn grows. The corn is plentiful. The irrigation system works, the barns are full, Joseph builds all these barns. After three years, this is, this is what it says in the Bible, the corn was without number, so he didn't need to count anymore. He had so much corn, he didn't know what to do with it. The barns were squeezed full with corn, and then the famine comes, and the government is able to feed the people of Egypt. And by the way, it says it very clearly in the Bible, they don't just give it away. There's no welfare dependency in Egypt. They sell it, but at such a large price. And of course, the famine affects the whole region, so people come from Palestine and other neighboring countries because Egypt is the only place to perform. And you remember the story, eventually the brothers come, and then he sends them back, and the brothers come with Jacob, Joseph's father. And it's a wonderful family reunion. And the story is a very inspiring story in the Bible about redemption, forgiveness, family, loyalty, truth, honesty, betrayal, all of these stories are fantastic stories. But I'm not telling you the story for those moral reasons, important though those are. I'm telling you there's a different way. Think about the first thing, the dream of seven years of plenty and that seven years of famine. We have a name in Britain for that kind of dream. We call it a treasury forecast. It's a 15 year economic forecast. Do you remember, people used to say there's been an end to boom and bust. It's not true. There's never an end to boom and bust. This was maybe the first recorded boom and bust in economic history, but it keeps happening. So the question then comes, what else is true about this story? It's a story of delivery. Once the 15-year the forecast is published and the Pharaoh understands it, then he says, well, we've got to prepare, we can't wait for seven years and see what happens. We're going to be prepared now. And you're in charge. And he says, I'm in charge, obviously, for the Pharaoh. You're in charge, Joseph. Then you, somebody in each region, somebody in each district, somebody in each barn. That is what we in delivery associates in deliverology call a delivery chain. And it's got to work. 
he went out to the front line and back. Then take um, Joseph's idea that it should be 20 percent of the corn every year for seven years. We call that a trajectory. Here's the graph. He knows how much corn he's got to save every year. After three years, the corn is without number. We call that a head of trajectory. It's a story of delivery. He never gets distracted. Joseph just does that. That's the only job he has. And the Pharaoh has made it very clear at the beginning, don't go around in the palace, go and see for yourself. You can't do delivery if you sit around in the uh, Pharaoh's palace or in Santiago or in London. You've got to go and work. So you've got to count the data, you've got to build the delivery chain, you've got to have a plan, you've got to count the call, and you've got to go to the front line and see that. And I'm telling you this story because some people say that Tony Blair and I invented the idea of delivery, and it's not true. It was invented in ancient Egypt. It's thousands of years old. The question for all of us is why, if we've known about that for so long, we still get it wrong so often around the world. And my content in the next 20 minutes is about how to try more often to get it right. And there's a reason for this. Um, governments need to deliver. They need to deliver for their own benefit, of course, but that's not the main point. I don't know what you think when you look around the world in 2019. I see a crisis of liberal democracy. I see a crisis of confidence in government. I see a growth of cynicism about government, not just any particular government, but government in general. I even see a crisis of democratic legitimacy. Too many people too cynical about democratic institutions. If that grows too far, where will we end up with freedom of speech, with rule of law, uh, with the democratic values that have been so important in the last century uh, as they've been fought over in different parts of the world? Now, I'm not saying that being able to deliver as a government is the only answer to that huge problem, but I am saying it's part of the solution. I am saying that if governments don't deliver, I'm talking about the whole world here, if governments don't deliver, that cynicism will grow. If they do deliver, that cynicism can be reduced. What's more, the problems they're facing, and Ignacio mentioned this, are often global. Um, we all have to come back to climate change, but we can't do it just in one country. We have to do it in each country, we have to do it collaboratively. So we don't just need to deliver in the traditional sense of a good health service, although that's important, or an education service, that's important to cut crime. We have to begin to deliver in what Ignacio would call these, these wicked problems. And the, the, the skills and attitudes and processes that bring effective delivery are very important for individual governments, for government in general, for democracy in general, and for solving the huge problems that we face as a human race on planet Earth. So, I'm going to talk about delivery, and I'm not pretending that this is the solution to everything. I'm pretending I'm saying that at least we can get this right, and then there's lots of other things we need to think about. And please feel free to ask anything. So, I, know, I meet lots of politicians around the world. It was mentioned in the introduction. I've worked in um, 60, or 60 or more countries. And there's a lot of politicians I meet. And here I'm not talking about Chile. Uh, there's a lot of politicians I meet who think that this is what you do. You get the policy right, you have a big argument about the policy, you write a document, you pass a law, and then you move on and do the next thing. And you leave the implementation to some hapless official, uh, and they'll get the job done. And then a couple of years later, you suddenly remember, oh yeah, I've passed that law, what happened? And the answer is not very much. But the truth about delivery is it's more the other way around. I'm not saying getting the policy right is easy, it's difficult. It needs argument, it needs debate, it needs uh, academic insight, it needs uh, political leadership, all of those things. But even when you've got it right, 90% of the task is making it happen. And that's a, an attitude shift in the way politicians think, in the way they spend their time, in the way they use their power and influence to try and shape the world. Here's a way of thinking about it. If you're a minister, or a prime minister or a president, um, on the vertical axis, uh, you can see how bold you want to be. Now, often new governments want to be very bold because they've been out of power, they come in uh, 
they've got a huge surge of legitimacy from the recent election results and they want to be bold and they keep saying to officials, be bolder, be more radical, this is too cautious. And the officials are saying, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. We tried that before, it's difficult. Uh, in Britain, the debate goes like this. The politician says, let's be bold. And the officials say, well, hang on a minute, why don't we do some more research first? Or well, the politician says, I want to be bold. And the official says, why don't we try a pilot study? Or in the old days, the politician says, we want to be bold. And the official says, well, let's try it out in Scotland first. <laughs> Uh, so this debate goes up and down the up and down the vertical axis, but it changes when you start on the horizontal axis. How well are you going to get this done? If you're a newly elected government, you need some early quick wins, not necessarily to involve reforms, some cautious reforms. Just do them properly, implement them effectively. So if you have a few things that are not that bold, but just good, sensible, pragmatic things and get them done, then people say, oh yeah, they know what they're doing. And of course you have some bold reforms as well, but when you don't just have the argument about them, make sure you have an approach to implementation that will lead to transformation. And if you're a minister of education or health or whatever it might be, some of your policies should aim here because uh, that's a good thing to get some short-term quick wins. Some should aim there because you're an ambitious politician and you want to change the world for the better. If they're all translation, you've probably got too much risk. If they're all here, you're probably not radical enough. And if they're in the grey half of this, you're not doing your job well enough. So the question for any minister or any government is, can you list your big priorities and then shift them onto the yellow half of this chart. You can do it in a darkened room on your own in the evening so nobody sees and just map it onto there. Um, this approach to delivery has been taken in lots of countries around the world, um, but I don't want to dwell on that. I want to show you this picture of New York City in 1776. You'll remember 1776 was a big year in American history. That was the year of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and um, it was the year the British sent an army to try to uh, put a stop to all that. And they landed on Manhattan Island and they burned down New York City. And in the same month or two that they were passing the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, New York City was in flames. And George Washington, leader of the US incipient American, not really US, uh, American army retreated from Manhattan to the mainland. And in the Continental Congress, um, one of the representatives from uh, North Carolina got up and he said, we have to face the brutal facts. It's all very well passing a declaration of independence, but New York City is in flames. And there are a serious debate where they got away from all the beautiful language that Jefferson had written in the Declaration of Independence and they had a proper debate about the state of things. They were going to be defeated unless they reformed the army. They were going to be defeated unless the 13th colonies would give George Washington some soldiers. They were going to be defeated if they took on the British in set battles because they would lose every time. So they drew the British into a long, hard struggle. But the first part of delivery is confronting brutal facts and they don't get much more brutal than that. And uh, the same is true of any major reform. Um, you have to face up to the state of things uh, and not be in denial. Um, the other thing about delivery is that when you start, particularly if you're in, uh, um, a new government or new, you're, you're taking on a new reform, you may be an existing government but you've got a new reform, is you announce it, you say we're going to do this wonderful thing, uh, it's going to be very exciting, everybody gets fired up, they really want it to work. But after you've set the idea, there's a long time lag before you get the results. And in that time, you're making people change what they do because it's a bold reform. And in the time when people are having to work hard to change, they're feeling the pressure, maybe you make, make some mistakes, but you haven't got any results yet, you get this dip. I call it the implementation dip. Almost always happens with big reform. One of the tasks of the political leadership 
is to carry people through that dip. To understand that it's likely, even maybe to predict it, but to say, we know because we're checking that the reform is working. It's true we haven't got results yet, but it will come through because we're doing the right things. So being able to carry people through the implementation dip. Too many reforms around the world, you get into the implementation dip and then you give up. I've seen this happen many, many times. A very good friend of mine was the head of the school system in Louisiana 10 years ago after Hurricane Katrina. He did a brilliant job and the governor encouraged him to be very radical uh, and say he would support him. But then when the reform got really conflict, a lot of conflict, very controversial, they were in the implementation dip, the governor just left him. We call it English, hung, hung him out to dry. Uh, you have to have political leadership to get through this dip, and you have to know that it's likely to come. But the core of deliverology is these five questions. It's very simple stuff, not conceptually difficult. We don't need university professors to ask these questions. We just need pragmatic, thoughtful people. University professors can add refinement and critique. Question one is, what are you trying to do? How many governments can be really clear about four or five priorities, the things they want to get done in that term of office? So clarifying priorities is really important because there are only so many hours of the day, only so many days in the week. Um, the British uh, writer 100 years ago, comic writer Oscar Wilde once said, socialism will never come because there aren't enough evenings in the week. <laughs> This is hard work, so you have to be clear about your priorities and then not just clear about what the priorities are, but how you're going to measure progress. What are the objectives, what are the goals, what are the specific things that will tell you that you've succeeded? It's no good saying, I want a better health system. In what ways will it be better and how will you measure that? I want a better school system. In what ways will it be better how will you measure that? So that's question one. Question two is, very obvious as well, if that's what you want to do, how are you going to do it? This is about planning, and um, <coughs> I see lots of plans around the world. I see five-year plans and ten-year plans and uh, beautiful plans with nice glossy covers. I see plans sitting on the shelves of bureaucrats. What I'm talking about is a real operational plan that you're using every day. Um, maybe it has coffee stains on it, uh, but it's a plan that says three things, only three things that really matter in the plan. What are the specific actions we're going to take? When are we going to get the action done, each action done? What is the deadline? And who is responsible? That's all you need in the plan. It's got to be operational and practical and specific. And then it goes on and says, and if we do that, what effect will the plan have on the outcomes? How will implementing the plan change the outcomes? That leads to the third question, which is, how will you know at any given moment that you're on track? Uh, this is about data systems, uh, partly. So as you implement your plan, you know where, let's say, let's say you want to reduce crime by 30%. You know where crime <coughs> figures are now. You know where you want them to be in four years' time. 30% drop. As you look your plan, what will the shape of that curve be? Would it be a straight line? That's what, if you ask for a trajectory from the average British civil servant, they will give you a straight line. Because their most sophisticated analytical equipment is a ruler. But actually, the real world very rarely moves in straight lines, even in physics. It moves in different ways. So you get seasonal variations. Some, some trajectories you have to work really hard at the beginning and then you know, some you get a big kick at the beginning and then it gets harder. So the shape of the curve, what will it be? So one of the things, you've got your goal, you've got your plan, and now you've got your data system to measure progress. But you've got to know what you expect should happen in the trajectory. Um, and you won't, be, you won't be right. If you predict a trajectory, of course, it'll be wrong sometimes because nobody predicts the future accurately. The point about the trajectory is to make you think about the connection between the actions and the outcome. And then when there's a variation between what actually happens in the trajectory, 
Well, that raises interesting questions that you haven't made. But the most important thing is to be able to track progress exactly as Jose did for the Pharaoh. After 30, after three years, the corn was without number. He was ahead of trajectory, but he had his trajectory. He knew what he was trying to do. But the other thing about having data is you've got to have, you've got to, it's good having a data system and just monitoring. You've got to make sure there's a process by which the leaders of this reform check the data and see whether it's working or not. So you have to create routines. Uh, everybody in this room, and many of you have had a part in government one way or another, or seen governments close up. Everybody knows that in the modern world, governments are constantly interrupted by crises, by things that go wrong. There might be big international crises like uh, in my time in number 10 Downing Street, the September the 11th of 2001. Or there might be some crisis of uh, a particular minister getting into trouble over uh, ethics or some relationship or whatever it is. All these things that go wrong. There's lots of things that happen in governments all the time. The question for the leader, for, the, for a minister in the ministry or for a, a prime minister or a president is how do you keep your priorities on track through the crises. And for that, you need to build routines into the way you spend your time. If you're a leader in a political system, your time is the most precious resource in that government, more precious than money. So how you allocate your time? So what we did in the Blair administration, I've now seen governments like Justin Trudeau in Canada, the current government in New South Wales and Australia, several governments in Africa, monitoring progress routinely through a stock take. Every three months, the leader sits with the people around them, they look at the progress of the trajectory, they solve problems. These are not meetings for allocating blame, they're meetings for real, practical, confronting the brutal facts and solving problems. And if you can get that going, it makes an enormous difference. You see how simple this is conceptually. And then fourthly, fourth question, if you're not on track, what are you going to do about it? There are lots of people around the world who think that when they run the problem, the best thing to do is just to kind of leave it alone and hope it will get better. I had a friend a long time ago when I was an undergraduate in Oxford. I had a friend, he had quite an old bicycle. Um, and he had a problem with the transmission system between the pedals and the back wheel. Uh, he got back from the cycle ride and being horrible, he had to push it the last mile. Um, he said he got the problem and I said, how are you going to fix it? He said, I've put it in the garden, I hope it will get better. <laughs> that sounds absurd, but that is what happens in bureaucracies all over the world. We put a problem in the garden and hope it will get better. And just occasionally it might, but mostly it won't. So, problem solving, when you identify a problem, do something about it. And if it's a complicated, wicked problem, to use uh, Ignacio's phrase, Try something, and if that doesn't work, that's not a failure, you tried, it didn't work. Try something, and then if that didn't work, try something else. But don't give up, because if the problem is you, it's a barrier to you achieving your goal, you have to solve it. And the first thing you try, you learn from it. The second thing you try, you learn from it. Eventually, you'll find a way forward. These are complicated problems. They're not easy. They're not simple. The media may be screaming at you, but don't worry about that. Just get on with the job of solving the problem. Um, and um, make sure that you're checking that these problems are actually being solved. If some is not the case, don't give the benefit of the doubt. What I say to people who are saying, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt, I say, if you're about to give the benefit of the doubt, why are you so doubtful? Make sure the, 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 pro, the rigor of the problem solving matches the scale of the problem. And then the final uh, question is, how can we help? That's what the delivery unit or the delivery function doesn't need to be called the delivery unit. The delivery thinkers in the government, that's what they ask. How can we help? How can we help solve your problems? Uh, have you thought about what they're doing in other countries? Have you thought about what they're doing around the world? I'll tell you a, a brief story here um, about the railways in Britain. We had a problem with railway performance back in 2001-2002 when I was working for Tony Blair. And the worst month of the whole year in railway uh, punctuality was, was October. Why was it the worst? Because that was autumn and the leaves fell off the trees, landed on the railway lines, it rained, the leaves became a kind of mushy pulp, which reduced the friction. So the train drivers were worried that if they put the brakes on, the train would slide and they would be in trouble. So they go more slowly, so they're late. 
por los días más tarde. Lo que por cierto. Uh, we this place where the first ever passenger train in history Britain and gets a job there and you're late for work 
And if somebody says, why are you late? All you have to say is, the leaves on the line. And it works not only in October, it works all year round. So, uh, let's move on. Uh, in addition to answering these questions, you need good data, data visualization. So, this is Burkina Faso Health System. This is the dashboard that we work with the government of the health ministry of Burkina Faso so they can see where all their problems are in the different uh, provinces of Burkina Faso. Uh, but data visualization is so easy now. I'm sure you've got lots of experts, but too often data is badly presented, it's not, it's not properly collected, but this is really important because then you can track it in real time. In, and then, uh, as I mentioned, you need routines. This is Pakistan, this is the province of Punjab. Each, each district of the province different colour, is it delivery or not? You can see this one here, not delivery, not delivery, doing well. The Indus runs down here, so this sometimes gets flooded. Um, but they, they need, the, the, the Chief Minister of Punjab needs to know not just whether it's got a problem, where exactly is it? You can do that for Chile for the 16 provinces uh, here. You can do it for every district. This visualisation of data and then the ability to present the data clearly to a Prime Minister, a President, a Minister, in a way that they can understand. People tend to assume that Ministers are somehow uh, enormously skilled statisticians, but that's not their skill set. They may be, but they're probably not. So present the data beautifully. When we presented this, these maps to the Chief Minister of Punjab for the first time, he said, I will sleep with those under my pillow. I understand now. Um, and then, moving into the future, I'm finishing on this, you need, to, in the end, the debate is going to be about public value. You take, in Chile, every other country, you're taking money from people, we call it tax, and you spend it. It's not government money, it's other people's money. It comes to the government and the government spends it again. So people want to know what they get for their money. This is work I'm doing for the UK Treasury. We spend about £900 billion every year. How do you know you get value for £900 billion? Well, the first thing is, did you achieve the objectives? The money was allocated for different uh, specific objectives. Did it achieve them? That's what I've been talking about in the last half hour. Did you manage the money properly? Did it go to, did it go to where it was meant to go? Was it spent on what it was meant to be spent on? Was it allocated fairly? Was it transparent? Did everybody understand why it was distributed the way it was? This is a core function of the finance ministry, but they don't always do it well. And then, and I know um, Ignacio was working on this, Anyone know, did the users benefit? If you're trying to solve public health, like in this country, here, right here in Santiago, the mayor has been overseeing a brilliant reform of reducing childhood obesity. He's got very good data, it's working. It's a credit to the mayor, it's a credit to the city of Santiago, and I know in Chile as a whole, we've got a big strategy on uh, childhood obesity and reducing you can only do that if the parents collaborate, if the families understand, if they play an active part. So the citizen has to be a user, a, a participant, as well as a citizen. Uh, the same is true if you, want to, uh, uh, if you want children to learn more at school, getting, getting the school right and the teaching right and the books right is good, but if the parent reads with the child at home, they'll learn to read faster. There's lots of ways the citizen can play a part. You get more value for public money if you get this right. And governments struggle with this, but it's very important. It's a big theme for the future, as Ignacio was saying. And then finally, there's an underlying issue about institutions. You could do all these things, but leave the institutions weaker. If you put them in a corrupt way, or an unethical way, or you didn't recruit enough staff for the future, Let's say you were running a healthcare system, you deliver all this, but you haven't got enough doctors coming through medical school. So are you leaving the institutions better than you found them? If you get all these four things right, that is public value. That should be the goal for government. And then you can explain to people what you're doing with their money. So delivery is part of a wider issue about how you explain to people how you're using their money. And there are only two sources of money for governments. There's tax, which is this generation's money, and the debt, which is the next generation or generation after their money. It's always other people's money. You need to be able to account to them. Uh, we're working on this in the Treasury at the moment in, in the UK. Uh, 
we haven't got it going yet, but in the next spending review, it's just about to start, and this will be an important way of thinking about it. I think this is a coming agenda, because people want better services, but they don't necessarily want to pay taxes uh, higher. They want rising expectations, but limits on taxes. They need to know how their money is being spent. Um, and then you need to think about how you're getting people on board. This is a map of you, 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 any reform, there's some opponents, there's some uh, supporters, there's some people who don't really matter, uh, they're just kind of ticking along, not paying attention, and then there's people like you, but they aren't influential. You need to shift people across from there to there. You need to think consciously about that building, a coalition of support for some radical reforms, and the key to that is delivering and being effective. Once the results start coming through, people start saying, oh yeah, that was actually quite good. I didn't like it. Now it's quite good. Sometimes they even say, that they, you know that they didn't like it when it started, but now they say, actually it was my idea. Uh, so this, this, this happens. And um, here's a conclusion. On the, on the red side, those are the things that are very common in governments, but they don't work. And on the green side, these are the things that I've been talking about in the last half an hour. Um, I'm going to leave the slides in Spanish here, and anybody who wants them can ask Ignacio and his colleagues uh, to send them to you. Um, thank you very much for your time and attention. It's been a pleasure with you. <laughs>